Today we return to the upper room, to, to where the disciples are in hiding, in fear, terrified of the religious leaders and terrified by what this story of the empty tomb might mean. We often think of Easter as a time of great celebration, and it is. However, we mustn't miss the fact that this is an awesome experience, uh, an amazing event, and by its very nature, the very center of the universe of our faith. There are other resurrections in the Bible. There There are a couple in the Gospels. The resurrection of Lazarus, for instance, inspired awe and amazement in the people. It inspired wonderment at the authority of Christ to raise the dead. It inspired fear on the part of the religious leaders, further solidifying their decision to get rid of this troublesome, meddlesome, rabble-raising rabbi. What was different about Jesus' resurrection? What was different about the resurrection of Christ our Lord? Well, it's that the one to whom it happened. Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Messiahs aren't supposed to die. They aren't supposed to apparently lose at the hands of those they're supposed to defeat. And that's what the crucifixion and death of Jesus looked like to them. It looked like a loss. It looked like a disaster. It looked like a horrific end. And from the common perspective, it was exactly that. And so it is even more important that it is this Jesus, this Christ, this Messiah who is raised. Who not only returns to life, but returns to life victorious. Not weakened, not sickly, but victorious. He defeated death. Having defeated the power of sin, which put him there having defeated the weight of our finitude and sinfulness with the boundless power of grace and the endless life-transforming love of God. This Jesus, this Messiah, this Christ, this is the one who is raised, and his resurrection proclaims victory over sin and over death. In the history of the church, the church east and west has often viewed the, the, the elements of both the death of Jesus and his resurrection differently. They both recognize the truth of both points, but in the west it's the importance of his victory over sin that is critical in our thinking. Whereas in the eastern church, in eastern orthodoxy, it's his victory over death, which brings victory over sin and brings life eternal to us all. The disciples were terrified, terrified at the thought of what all this might mean, terrified at the still raging anger of the religious leaders and at what they might do to them now that Jesus' body is gone. It's into this swirling mess of emotion, fear, and anxiety that Jesus appears. While they were still talking about all of this, it says, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Of course they were terrified. You would be too. We've all seen those horror movies where ghosts come and attack or where zombies climb out of their graves and lumber through the streets trying to eat people's brains. We've all seen that in the movies and on TV. I seriously doubt we would handle this any better than they did and probably quite a lot worse. They were understandably terrified. They were understandably in a swirl at the same time of both wonderment and fear, questioning and teetering on the edge of faith, of belief. We would be too. Like the disciples, we wouldn't yet have had the experience of knowing deep down inside that this is precisely what Jesus told us would happen. 
They didn't yet understand it. Unlike us, they hadn't heard the stories of this event for all their life. This is totally and completely unexpected. Totally and completely beyond their experience or expectation. Jesus could tell them right out what was going to happen and they still didn't get it. And neither would we. The reaction of the disciples is precisely what our reaction would have been. In fact, I dare say that they, they have been dealing with it a whole lot better than we would have. And yet, they're still startled and still terrified. They're still struggling with belief. They're still startled and terrified and disbelieving and wondering. Huh, such a swirl of emotions, such a swir swirl of pain and fear and trembling. And again, as with the story of Doubting Thomas, Jesus addresses their feet, their fear, their doubts, their questions. Jesus doesn't leave them spinning in the swirl of anxiety and emotion. He addresses it directly. Why are you frightened, he asks. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look, look at my hands and look at my feet. See that it is I. It is I myself. Touch me and see. For ghosts don't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then he showed them his hands and his feet and his side. And while they were disbelieving and still wondering. That phrasing there is powerful, disbelieving. Their faith was wavering, it was struggling, it wanted to be there, but it wasn't quite there yet. And they were wondering, they were excited about this, they were hoping this might be true. They were thinking, how can this possibly be so? They're so excited, they're about to burst. Have you anything to eat, he asks. <laughs> well, well, yeah, here's, here's some broiled fish. And he took it and did a most mundane thing. He ate it in their presence to prove that he's real, to prove that he's right there in their midst. Here we see Jesus working overtime to prove that he's there, that he's not a ghost, that he's not some figment of their imagination, that he's not some hallucination. And Jesus says and does all of this because the disciples need it. And we need it too. We, like the disciples, need convincing that this is really Jesus. That death has not had victory over him. And that while he did die, now he's we're here with us today in this very moment. Their terror and amazement their disbelieving and wonderment. It reflects this emotional morass, powerful anxiety, fear, trembling, amazement. This is huge, my friends. As important as the crucifixion was, and it was important, on many levels, both tragic and extraordinary, this moment, this reality, this event, this resurrection, the continued real presence of Jesus among us, then and there, here and now, is the crossroads where life and death meet eternity. To paraphrase Jesus, because he lives, we shall live also. To quote the hymn, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. You know, we sing that hymn, but do we listen to the words? Because he lives. Because he lives, all fear. All, not some fear, all fear. Fear of life and fear of death. Fear of success and fear of failure. 
Fear of a virus and fear of dying. All fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living. Just because he lives. That hymn speaks to me today, my friends. That hymn speaks to me throughout Easter season. That hymn has spoken to me many times in the previous year as we faced the unknown future of this stupid virus. And I've said, I wish we could pretend it isn't there, but we can't afford that. But because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear and fear is gripping on, fear is trying to take control, fear is there. Because he lives, all fear is, not will be, is gone. Because I know he holds the future, life is worth the living just because he lives. It's in this context. This swirl of emotion, this swirl of anxiety that the disciples were experiencing in that upper room. It's in this context, in this wonderment, disbelieving, fear, and anxiety that Jesus then says this. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. In the midst of their spiral of emotion, in the midst of fear and trembling, in the midst of disbelieving and wonderment in the midst of all of this with Jesus showing them his hands and his feet and eating broiled fish and speaking with them. He then gives them this amazing calling, this amazing duty. We often overlook the opening of their minds, but we mustn't do that. It's so very easy for us to read scripture and not really connect with what it's saying, to struggle with it, to misunderstand it, to not understand it. We do it all the time. It takes the Holy Spirit opening our minds for us to truly connect, not just at a mental level, but at a heart level, to truly connect with what the scriptures are saying to us, and particularly here with this. The scripture that was being opened to them, was, of course, not the New Testament. That hadn't been written yet. The scripture that was being opened to them was the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to the all nations beginning from Jerusalem. That last bit gets overlooked too. We focus on the message of the death and resurrection, and we should focus on it, but not to the exclusion of the rest. Repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in Jesus' name to all nations, to all people. The Greek word being translated nations is ethnos. We get the word ethnicity from it. The message of repentance and forgiveness is to be proclaimed to everyone without exception, without limit, without qualification, without barrier. The message of repentance 
The word being translated as repentance means quite literally to change your mind. Huh? I thought it was to feel sorry for what you did. No, that's contrition, friends. Repentance means to change your mind. Well, I thought it meant changing your behavior. That follows from changing your mind. But metanoia means to change your mind. It's both as simple and as difficult as that. Well, I don't think I want to change my mind, Greg. My way of thinking, my beliefs about others and myself, I don't want to change those things. Okay. Hmm. I'll change uh, how I act around people. I'll do my best to treat other people kindly, nicely. I'll, I'll outwardly not judge them. But I'll... I'll, I'll keep from saying something negative about them in public for fear of getting canceled. But I won't change my mind. I'm sorry. That's not what God is looking for. It's not just an outward change God's looking for. God's looking for that inward change. The change of the mind, the change of the heart, the change of the spirit, the change of your very self. We're not forgiven because we agree to behave good. We're not forgiven because we act nice towards people. We're not forgiven because we even stop doing bad things. We receive forgiveness when we repent. When we realize, recognize that what we did was wrong and change our minds, our hearts about what we're doing and what we're going to do. We receive forgiveness when we truly, inwardly, deep down inside change. What, you mean I can't fake it and just treat other people better? Nope. God knows if you're faking it. And to be blunt, you can be a great actor, but eventually your actions will betray your inner thoughts, your inner beliefs. The message of the gospel is to be proclaimed to all people without exception. And that message includes repentance, a change of the absolute core of yourself, and forgiveness. And they're held together for a reason. Without one, the other is impossible. And without the other, the first is incomplete. And the message goes to and is for all. There's no limitation. It begins from Jerusalem. And that's important because it it nearly happened that this message about Christ was kept only within the Jewish community. It took someone like Paul to break it out to the Gentile world. And that's good news for us Gentiles, right? We were once outsiders, not included in the covenant community, in the relationship with God, the creator of this world. We weren't welcomed in. Oh, we could enter, but we weren't sought out. We were outsiders. We Christians like to think of ourselves as the spiritual insiders. Uh, we're, we like to think that we're all that and a bag of chips, too. Well, we're not. And we tend to think that others shouldn't be included due to racial or ethnic or cultural or social or ethical concerns, or if they are to be included, they've got to change. That's what repentance is, right? Well, pot, meat, kettle. We are the ones on the outside looking in. We are the ones 
who need to change. When we exclude, when we deny, when we refuse to accept, when we refuse to live by the grace and the peace of Christ. The disciples, when they were confronted by the risen Christ, it says they were in disbelief and wonderment. They were terrified. And quite frankly, we are too. Our focus of faith must be not on ourselves, our own strength and abilities, on a church, on an institution like the church. Our faith shouldn't be focused even on something like the Bible. Our faith must be focused solely on Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, our risen Savior, our Redeemer. Our faith is in the Word of God, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, Jesus the Christ the Messiah, about whom we learn in Scripture, about whom we learn in church and in worship and from each other. Our faith is to be focused there. Our disbelief needs to be wiped out by an equal encounter with the risen Christ. Each of these disciples came to faith. Each of these disciples came to a faith that saw them through persecution in this life. Peter, crucified upside down. Mark was eventually dragged. He wasn't a disciple at this point, but he was eventually dragged to his death in the streets in Alexandria, Egypt. As I said last week, Thomas was pierced with a Brahmin sword and died in India. Philip was crucified on a cross at a weird angle. Paul, not one of the twelve, but an apostle, was beheaded for his faith. John, an old man, eventually died on the Isle of Patmos, imprisoned. All because they refused to recant their faith. In Jesus. In other words, true metanoia occurred in them. And true metanoia, true change, can occur in us. That's the message we are called to proclaim. That is the one, Jesus the Christ, the risen Lord, is the one we are called to proclaim. Let's be about proclaiming it. As the people of God in word and in deed. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may God's people say, Amen. In your presence, Lord, let me learn at your Oh